and to be recorded. And then let's start with this webinar on Babette and Kiran. Uh, welcome everybody. And let's start with our Swedish. Um, um, oh, I'm, I'm really have to start <laughs> on Monday morning with English. It is a little struggle. Um, Let's we'll start with the Swedish experiences, and that is both technical as emotional. I ask everybody also to say a few words on what the, how the uh, storm uh, affected their uh, emotional stress or their colleagues or whatever. So it's not only technical, but also social and emotional. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, let's start with Sebastian Emile. Can you? All right. So I should be on, right? Yes. You can hear me? Perfect. Yes. Can you also see my screen? Yes, we can see and hear you clearly. Can you see uh, my presentation? Yes. Or are you seeing something else? Huh? Now we see a presentation, yeah. Start from the beginning. Yeah. There. Brilliant. So, Babette from a Swedish perspective. And Petra, I just want to ask, should I stay to 15 minutes or should I be done by 20 past? Oh, to 15 minutes, it's okay. Okay. So this is from a Swedish perspective, and I am Sebastian Bukhari Ymir. I work at the Swedish Geotechnical Institute, which is the national authority in charge of coordinating coastal erosion in Sweden. And this event that we had, Babette, was it was we saw some pretty high levels, some high water levels, but they weren't like super extreme. We had an event in 2017 that was pretty similar, but in terms of effect, this was very, very different. And the reason can be seen in this plot. What we see is a scatter plot where we have uh, water levels on the x-axis and uh, wave height on the y-axis. And this is a plot from, from the southeast of Sweden in Singlishamn. And basically what we can see that normally when we have high water levels, sorry, high waves, that is high on the y-axis, then we have low water levels. And similarly, when we have high water levels, then we have very low wave heights. But what happened during Babette is what you see in red here. So we had a situation where you both had high water levels and high waves, and yellow is the 2017 event, which was similar in water heights or storm surge level, but there were hardly any, any erosional effects in 2017. So from a Swedish perspective, by far the big issue here or the big difference with that sets a bit apart is the erosion that it caused. And that's also what I'm going to focus on. And I should say that these two, uh, what we're looking now, we're looking at a mixture of hindcast and forecast data. So they're not exactly the same, but the general image is still pretty clear that Babette was for sure what we'd say an outlier in terms of, of high waves and high water levels at the same time on the south and east coast. And these high waves and high water levels at the same time, they led to quite a lot of coastal erosion and damage along the coasts. This here is an image that I've taken from, from my friends at Sveco, um, showing coasts with significant erosion, damaged buildings and damaged roads. And I'd say this is, we know that this is not all of it. This is not the full picture. As we learn more, as sort of time settles and we get to investigate it more, we'll find for sure more areas that have been damaged. So this is just a snippet showing that Babette hit pretty hard along a lot of the east coast and a lot of the south coast. And looking at some examples of what that actually looks like, if we start in the at the northeast, this is Aarhus, and you have the red line there to help you sort of navigate and find reference points. So this is on the 18th of October, a few days before the storm hit. Uh, and on the 23rd of October, so a few days after the storm hit. And you can see there's pretty severe erosion of the, of the dunes here. And actually, the reason that we have so good images from before is because as the forecast became clearer and clearer that this was going to be a big event, this was going to be a very different event from a Swedish context, and a lot of people were out in the field, mainly actually private sector, private sector, but also academia and public sector, we're out in the field documenting the situation before and then during the events and also after the event. So a lot of field work. Another example, now we're in the, along the south coast. This is, I believe, a stormwater outlet uh, where you can see the beach or the dunes have retreated uh, know, maybe 10, 15 meters here at least. 
This is Bering Strand. Again, this is the south coast. A road that was there just a few days before the storm is now not there anymore. You have the tree for reference. Other infrastructure. Uh, to the left, we have Vipimella, that's on the east coast. A road that have, has been damaged. And to the right, we have Cosa Baria, where we can actually see that there is, no, is a revetment here. So there is a coastal protection in place, but that has only served as a ramp for the waves to, to ride up and completely undermined the road here, which is the access road to the local harbor in Cosa Baria. And there were also a few houses that were hit because I'll say this, this was not, Babette was not like at a societal level, a traumatic experience. Uh, we got away with just a fright, like as a society, but, but at an individual level, there were person, there were people who had really, really traumatic experiences and who, who will have lost a lot. And that just having individuals is very uncommon in Sweden that anybody sort of sees their house being washed into the sea is, is very, very uncommon in Sweden. So what we see here is from Snögehamn. This is maybe one of the more dramatic uh, places uh, that has suffered the most, where we can see that the concrete slab that the house used to stand on has fallen down. The ground under is completely eroded and the concrete slab has actually fallen down out of this house. Some other examples of, of houses that, of course, are very close to the beach, because this is an area that, remember, usually doesn't get this combination of high levels of high water levels and high waves at the same time. But the situation in 2021, we have the area of reference and the, the situation a couple of days after Babette. So obviously, people living in this house will have felt immense uh, stress and, and <laughs> like probably a lot of fear uh, during the event, wondering what was going to happen. And we can also see here that a, a pebble beach has become a sandy beach. And this is something we'll see in a couple of places that the beach type has changed quite a lot. The beach landscape or the coastal landscape has changed significantly during this one event. Here we have another example of uh, a house very close to the coast, of course, but you can see that the the wall that they used to have um, is no longer standing. It has tumbled due to erosion. And we can see again that the, the pebble beach that they used to have has become a sandy beach. So there's been a lot of onshore transport of, of sand during this event in this place. But it's not only sand that has been moved. We've also had these like onshore transports of stone a kind of stone overwash, uh, which we see in many places. This is the nicest example or the most interesting example that I've seen, but uh, a complete like stone overwash uh, created like new stone wall. So pebble beach is becoming sandy, but also uh, grass becoming stone beach in some areas. And just to show that we also have some pretty large scale effects. This is in Corsa Baria. It's the same place as we saw the road that was washed out where they where the waves had ridden up on the revetments. This is a little bit further to the east. And you can see that the ocean or the sea has taken a big chunk out of the dunes here, revealing some pretty spectacular geology as well. Some really, really nice stratification here. Uh, so large sediment volumes have been have been freed up and they will have ended up somewhere and they will be moving around in the system now. So that's also super interesting to see what happens to the sediment as we move on. And that moves into to sort of the what happens now. We have a few measurements. These are all mostly transect measurements from the days before Babette. And I said this is due to private sector and academia uh, going out the days before measuring places where they thought the storm would hit hard. And we have measurements following Babette. So we have some places where we'll have really good data for before and after, just a few days between. A lot of the coast is missing here. So we are working on a transit campaign now for 2024, 2023, sorry, that starts tomorrow, where we're hoping to measure all the magenta colored spots here. But still, this is just looking at spot snippets along the coast. So we would really like to have the regional view, the full regional view, and therefore, 
we have managed through cooperation of three national agencies and six municipalities. Uh, we've managed to push ahead the national uh, survey, the laser survey that they do, the LIDAR. It was not meant to be done for another three years, but it will be done now as soon as the weather allows. So that means the entire coast, southeast coast and south coast, will be flown with laser, uh, with LIDAR, and that will give us a really, really good baseline of what has happened after Babette. And with this baseline on a regional scale, then we hope that we'll be able to quantify the storm erosion, both dune and, and beach erosion. We will be able to quantify the recovery. We will be able to follow this red redistribution of the free nourishments that we've had, uh, all this sediment that has been, has been put into, not put in, but has been uh, mobilized in the system. Uh, we'll be able to see what happens to that, which will give us information of what would happen if we did a nourishment in that place, for instance. How, how would that nourishment be re redistributed? We also have really good, or we will have really good grounds for calibration of models, which will allow us to do scenario testing. What would have happened if it had been something more severe than Babette? I said, we got away with mere, merely just a fright, basically. Uh, what would have happened if, if Babette would have been more severe, like the 1872 storm, for instance? We'll have much better uh, data for that. All of this together will just give us a better general understanding of the coast. So we're super, super excited for the 2024 coming up. Uh, we think we'll, we'll be able to learn a lot about how the coast in, in South and East Sweden responds. And I'll just quickly say something about coastal management and this the personal. Because coastal management here in Sweden, severe erosion is very, very rare. It, it doesn't happen often, which has led to a very low degree of centralization of the coastal issues. And I said that we are at SGI in charge of coordinating, but we're not working hands on. Uh, so we have, comparatively speaking, a weak institutional capacity here in Sweden for dealing with erosion. And I say this as a representative of the institutional capacity. And very much of the responsibility falls on the individual landowners to protect their uh, their own land. But when we have an event like, like Babette, of course, landowners cannot, as individual landowners, deal with this. And there is this semi-vacuum, semi-institutional vacuum. And it's been really nice to see how the coast and coastal engineering community here has stepped up. And this is sort of my personal reflection, how I'm really proud of, of the coastal engineering community, um, coming from public sector, private sector, and academia working together to try and document as well as we can before, before, during, and after. And this is a picture of some of us out during the, the night of Babette, doing measurements, doing, doing field work, being in the field to see how, uh, how, it, how it struck, how it, how it hit us. So I'm going to end on this note with sort of the actual, the, the pride I feel about the coastal community in Sweden, or the coastal engineering community in Sweden. And I think that is my time up, so thank you very much. Indeed, it's very quick and dirty uh, presentation. So thank you so very much, uh, Bastian. And we do have some questions in the chat, um, but I would say I choose one because that was what we started with. Uh, did you also have um, is some evacuation? Did you have uh, as, uh, evacuation plans? How did that work? Uh, so Nothing that was organized. Uh, individual homeowners left their homes when they saw what was happening. Uh, a lot of these are some of the houses, a lot of the houses that we hit are summer houses. So the people that were there were able to just leave and, and sort of go to their uh, all year round house if they were there. But no coordinated evacuation. Do you also have some um, recovery discussions now that who to, who's to pay or who's to blame? <laughs> Do you have these yes, kind of especially, especially in Trelleborg. The, the the houses that we saw, I chose those because they're the worst hit. There's a lot of interesting discussion there, and I didn't put it in my slide, but municipalities actually have very limited responsibility here. And of course, people turn to the municipality. Um, and, and that is a discussion now that one of the municipalities is actually saying, maybe we should take a slightly larger responsibility than we really need to. But that will definitely have effects on all the other municipalities. Will they now have to take more responsibility than they have to. So this is also a super interesting management issue. Who who is going to pay for this? And of course, there is a push for uh, for saying nature-based solutions, but but these individual landowners, I find it very difficult to believe that they, on sort of a plot by plot scale, would be able to work nature-based. So if it's up to them, they will almost be forced into hard solutions. 
Okay, yes. Clear, I think. Very interesting to follow up and perhaps maybe uh, during the next screen meeting <laughs> to discuss about that and learn more about you. So thank you so very much. Um, I thank you. Best, uh, time wise, there are some few more questions in the chat. Perhaps you can answer them in the chat as well. And then we can go to Denmark. So sure. uh, are you ready for your presentation? Yes, I hope so. Just a second. Um, <clears throat> can you see my screen? Yes, you can see in view. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about the preliminary lessons we've learned from uh, Denmark, both during the storm, before the storm, and after the storm. And it's quite complicated because it has made such a huge, huge impact. So it's just a scratch on the surface you're going to, to hear today. Uh, just like Sebastian said, we had a lot of waves caused by this pattern of wind. That is uh, the average um, or the highest uh, averaged winds. So you can see it's above 25 meters per second in average in the southern part of uh, Den oh, sorry. Denmark uh, down here. And uh, because it came from the east, we have in some places a very, very long fetch. Uh, despite the fetch here is that long, we also saw some big waves. At uh, the link between uh, Denmark here and Germany, we have some measurement uh, devices, some wave boys, which you can see the results from here see that the average wave height is around two and a half to three meters out here with a corresponding um, storm surge level of 1.8 meters and uh, that is really a lot also like uh, Sebastian uh, told you and here's a map showing the inner Danish waters south of the little belt here the great belt here and the sound here and Sweden is over here and what you see is the uh, high storm surge level and the corresponding uh, <coughs> return uh, level. Um, and you can especially see from around south of Copenhagen, it is more than a one in a hundred year event. And uh, this uh, water level gauge here in Kuga has uh, measured uh, for more than hundred years. So it's really robust. Also down here in Gesa, Gesa it's also a uh, water level gauge that has monitored for more than 100 years. And all you can see down here, it's more than a 100 year event. So it's really, really a big area of Denmark that has been impacted. And um, that has really caused that is a national kind of um, storm. And it also um, caused the national operative staff, they were uh, kind of gathered and uh, they discussed how to handle this, especially uh, managing all the floodings and uh, erosions that took place during the storm. So it was really a significant storm. And um, as you are going to see, the results were also quite devastating uh, for society and also for individuals. Um, a colleague and my are a kind of uh, advisor for the national um, storm surge assurance uh, thing uh, driven by our ministry of uh, business and uh, this area shown by red is appointed as being hit by a storm surge so it's oh sorry it's mostly uh, most of the southern part here you can also see some clear effect of um, the easterly winds that we have some areas here where the water hasn't been able to be pushed in through these narrow straits. So it's quite low here, the water levels, but all the others, they're really, really high. And um, that caused some really severe damages. Um, and if you look into the history, here's our longest dike in Denmark. It's uh, on Lolland, called uh, the Lolland Dike. It's 56 kilometers long, being built after the 1872 storm surge to withstand that storm surge. And you can see here, there's a really a near breach here. And the impact, especially for the water level, wasn't as high as 1872. But I do not know which wave they designed 
uh, this uh, dike to withstand. But as you can see, we were at the very, very limit of failure. Um, the next one is also very long dike, the Felster dike, which is uh, facing also towards the east. In front of the dike, which is over here in the background, there's a dune. And there was some dune erosion. It was not that severe. I think it was around 10 meters of retreat. And there were no kind of failure of the dike and no damage on the dike itself. So you had this protecting dune in front. Um, so uh, that was a really good example. Here you have an area in the eastern part of the mainland of Jutland. Uh, it's quite hard to see what actually happened. This was an area where I was before the storm. And uh, this is the day after where I took this image. You can see the protecting dunes uh, here. Yeah, a beach ridge, I should call that, has uh, managed to uh, reduce the wave impact on the hinterland. But there's some uh, sediment being transported towards the coast. There was a barrier constructed uh, before the storm here of uh, kind of uh, pressed uh, uh, straws together. Um, it didn't withstand the waves. Uh, so you can see there's some flooding in here. It's, uh, I think, 10 hours after the, the storm peaked. So you had quite a lot of flooding in this area. That is quite kind of uh, what you look at uh, the, the common picture. What we also saw is uh, uh, this is another area that was flooded, but all these vertical uh, or slightly sloped walls made the waves, as Sebastian told you, uh, uh, be like a ramp. And in this case, a really, really uh, huge overspray together with a lot of debris inside. And you can see the windows here is completely gone. So there's a lot of um, damage caused by waves with something in the water. Here's an air, uh, another case where they put out these uh, steel plates and they collapsed and there's a lot of sediment being taken in here. But as you can see in most of the Denmark, people are still building in places where they shouldn't build. So that is part of yeah, the, the story. Here's another place where uh, the municipality at Faxaladeplas has uh, made a beach nourishment and that really made the waves to be dampened. So there weren't that many damages on uh, this part of the road, which there normally is. So they had a really good effect of uh, the beach nourishment. The same we saw at another place, Rødvi, where 18 ships were sunk in the harbor and some of part of the jetty were kind of uh, damaged, but they didn't have any damage on uh, the, the cliff behind the protecting uh, beach nourishment. Here's another case where you can actually see how uh, high up the debris has come. And also here, there's a, bit, a little bit of uh, overflow. Uh, so we have a lot of markers where we can calibrate the model we use to um, calculate how a uh, big storm surge is coming up and how much over top there will be. So we have been out surveying a lot of these markers in order to be uh, able to calibrate that in the aftermath. Here in Solo, south of Copenhagen, uh, we had a uh, protecting dune system that retreated. Uh, I heard it was a lot, but when I went there the day after, this is, uh, oh, sorry, a week after, um, just before going to the Life Coast Adapt in, in Sweden, you can see there's still a lot left. So um, the, the, the sediment that was transported away from the uh, dunes, you can actually see it out here in the water. So it's just nearby. That was really a good success with the, that nature-based solutions. And as you can see on the picture here to the right, there's some really, really high um, spray. Uh, if you have a vertical wall, which is down here, I didn't dare to go down there. So <laughs> that's why you can't see it. Uh, but you can have a look at the waves over here. And another place that were really shown in the medias was uh, this place. Uh, now uh, that is a house being built just half a year ago, where you can see the man, he is trying to push some, some stones away. But if you look a little bit more in uh, to his kitchen, you can really see there's really big stones being thrown from
from the Vretna and from the beach in into his uh, living room. Um, but the the funny, oh sorry, the interesting thing is that he said, "I'll come back and rebuild as the same way it was built before." And to my opinion, that is completely ridiculous to do. But um, they should do something to prevent this from happening again, because he was very impacted it, uh, by by this uh, accident. There was a lot of ad hoc intervention. Here's a protection in a harbor without waves. You can see these uh, compressed uh, straws and some plastic swapped around it. Uh, each private landowner, they also made a lot of uh, precautionary measures because it was a good forecast for the storm. They also put some valuable things on top of the tables. Here's an other example with some big bags with stones or sand. Here's uh, another thing uh, which I showed to you from about beforehand that functioned quite well, I should say, uh, but sometimes it failed. And then I've been really, really struggling with this area because um, is there a dike or not? Um, it depends a lot on if you can get any insurance money. And uh, the old houses built on on a ridge was there. Then they built dike around here and built houses in front and in back. And all these houses were flooded. So uh, we have a lot of discussions going on whether they should get support or not. The lessons learned is that um, society can only be aware uh, a few days in advance. And this woman, she has invited her family to to have a storm surge pizza and some red wine. So I talked to her while I waded through the flooded harbor. She was very uh, yeah, happy about the situation. She was also dry. So we have this issue about spatial planting in Denmark. We have built the completely wrong places and we are not being really aware about it. Um, but our emergency response reduced the damage significantly. And we have completely forgotten about the waves. Uh, so people are not really prepared for that. And we also had this uh, nature-based solutions that proved to be very, very resilient to these circumstances. So that was the end of uh, the lessons learned from uh, Denmark. Thank you very much, uh, Pa. Did, did you just say that this lady was uh, celebrating the flood? Did I understand that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was because they were so prepared for it and uh, they hadn't uh, any damages at all. So for them, they could overlook uh, the harbor master's office where they, there were scuba divers trying to protect it from being flooded. And there was a lot of action going on. So you have disaster tourism as well then, perhaps? Yeah, that is, I think that is one of the things that were really, really difficult for the emergency responses to, uh, to act because there was a lot of people coming to the flooded areas to see how it looked like. Uh, we we had some systems where you get an alert on your mobile phone, especially in a city where a water tube, uh, tube collapsed and the, some of the city were flooded. They really want people to go down there, but still people did, especially the news in their, their big cars and so on. They would like, there's a lot of uh, journalists and yeah, TV cameras all over the place. Interesting. So there will be the, also an extra dimension in the future when there are regions flooded or expected to be flooded. Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you, Per. I think also for you, there are some uh, questions in the chat. Um, I'm not diving in it now, maybe in the end, but perhaps you can already um, answer them in the chat. And yeah. uh, thank you very much. And I would like to go to uh, Germany, to Thomas Hirschauer. Uh, and you also would like to share your experiences on the German coast. Yeah, okay. I try to share my screen. So, do you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Yes, 
Yes, we see our screen now. Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, my name is Thomas Hirschhäuser. I'm working at the state agency for coastal protection in Schleswig-Holstein, and I want to give you an idea about the robotic storm surge uh, in Schleswig-Holstein. Um, <clears throat> I think I will skip uh, this slide. Uh, uh, I think all of you know that there are several components of Thomas, the Thomas, excuse me. I think we, we are looking at your presentation mode, not your actual presentation. Is it the, uh, in the presenter mode? I don't know, we just see ourselves at the moment. <laughs> we look at your teams. That looks good. Yeah. There's only one slide in vision now. Yeah. Okay. So do you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Okay, first of all, um, I want to give you an idea of what the Baltic coastline in Schleswig-Holstein looks like. We have a sequence of um, lowlands, which are protected by dikes. Um, altogether, we have around 70 kilometers of state dikes and uh, uh, around um, uh, 50 kilometers of regional dikes, which are maintained by the local water boards. Um, on the other hand, um, we have um, cliffs, um, but um, that risk area is around 300 square kilometer, 30,000 uh, people uh, live in that area and there are values of around 7 billion euro. Um, uh, what's also um, a special point for Baltic uh, uh, coastline in Schleswig-Holstein is that the major cities um, uh, such uh, as Kiel, Lübeck, uh, Schleswig, Flensburg, Eckernförde, are all located at, at the Baltic Sea and they all have no um, <clears throat> uh, flood protection systems. So um, this is the reason why I want to start um, with who is responsible for flood protection at the Baltic coast because the general public discussion uh, or the general public expectation is that the state is responsible for flood protection in place of Portland, but this is not the case. Uh, first of all, um, coastline flood protection is the responsibility of those who benefit from it. That can be privates, uh, as for example in Heiligenhafen. Um, that can be uh, the municipalities. This is an example of um, Eckernförde. Or this can be um, <clears throat> regional water boards, which are uh, responsible for the maintenance of um, yeah, regional uh, dikes, as uh, here in Susau, located in the uh, Lübeck Bay. Uh, the federal state um, is responsible for state dikes. Um, uh, so uh, state dikes um, protect the larger lowland areas. Uh, a significant number of affected uh, inhabitants uh, are present, and there is uh, significant infrastructure. Um, and the state is also responsible for coast protection on islands. And uh, in Schleswig Holstein, we have only one island in the Baltic Sea, which is Fema. 
Um, those are the flood hazard maps I will skip uh, that <coughs> um, slide. We have carried out a safety survey of our regional dikes, which means um, uh, we try to evaluate uh, which event uh, the regional dikes um, <coughs> uh, can uh, can protect. And this is an example of the regional dike of Ur. Uh, the black line um, is the um, dike crest, and um, the bars uh, you see is the recurrence interval of the event which um, uh, the dike can give uh, protection. So uh, you can see that uh, there are some parts of the dikes uh, where the dike can protect an event uh, which appears once uh, in 300 years, but there are other parts of the dike where the dike can only uh, give protection to an event uh, which is uh, yeah, something like a 10 years event. Um, the flood forecast um, uh, was no significant topic uh, during that event. Uh, it was, uh, to our opinion, rather good. Um, already three days in advance, we uh, know that a um, strong event will come and that it will reach around two meters in, in Flensburg. During the event, um, uh, <coughs> uh, the <coughs> Uh, the forecast was um, approximately uh, 20 centimeter too deep, but that was not a uh, main problem because um, all um, yeah, responsible authorities were, were prepared. In the end, uh, we reached maximum uh, levels, for example, in Flensburg of um, yeah, uh, 2 meter 27 above mean sea level or uh, in the latest. Um, Row Schleswig, where we reached a um, water level of two meter and twenty nine. Um, yeah, as uh, uh, <coughs> Pierre and Sebastian already told you, uh, we had um, a wind direction which came directly from the from the east, which you can see on the lower part of the slide, and the wind speed was uh, approximately twenty meter per second. In, in our region. The water level we reached um, was um, yeah, around a 20 years event uh, in the Kiel region and uh, below a 20 years uh, event uh, yeah, east and south of Kiel. But north of Kiel in Eckernförde, we reached a 50 years um, water level in the Schleifjord um, in Schleswig. Um, the water level reached a 200 years um, flood level. And in Flensburg Fjord, um, we reached a level which was above 50 years um, water level. The reason for that um, is that the fjords, uh, the Flensburg Fjord and the Schlei Fjord are uh, rather um, uh, yeah, exposed to the, uh, to the east, and, and though this leads to a quite high water levels in, in those fjords. Um, we had a lot of damage and different damages. Um, uh, let me start with regional dikes. We had uh, dike breaches in Arnis and in Fischliga. I will show you the locations later on. Uh, heavy damages at, um, yeah, especially the regional dikes, which were strongly exposed to the east. Um, and also um, at almost every regional dike, we had uh, damages. Um, <clears throat> Uh, tunes and other natural structures uh, were damaged, revetments uh, were damaged, uh, and also at the state dikes in, uh, on Fehmarn, uh, we had um, strong damage at the revetments. The coastal cities were inundated, um, those cities were no uh, <coughs> flood protection. Um, is, uh, uh, where we have no flood, flood protection. Um, altogether, we have a damage of 200 million euro. 140 million uh, <clears throat> belongs to municipalities and touristic infrastructure. 40 million to coast protection uh, measures and um, 20 million 
to it, uh, yeah, other uh, such uh, damages as for private, for example. Um, this is um, uh, a few of the uh, flood hazard uh, maps for Flensburg, Schleswig, and Eckernförde. And as you can see, uh, during a 200 years uh, flood, those uh, cities are inundated. And this uh, uh, the yeah, flood mark, for example, in Flensburg and, and Schleswig, uh, very close to that um, water level during a 200 years flood. This uh, are pictures of um, the dike bridge in, in Arnis. Arnis is located in the, in the Slide Fjord. Um, we had another dike bridge uh, at Dump, um, located um, yeah, south of the Schleif. And we had heavy damages at um, uh, yeah, a lot of other regional dikes, which were um, yeah, exposed to the east direction. This is a picture of the Gettinger Berg, uh, which is uh, close to the Flensburg Fjord. Um, and nowadays, this is a dam. Um, uh, a few years ago, this was a regional dike, but uh, yeah, maintenance uh, was stopped. And during the Baltic storm surge, uh, uh, the dam, uh, yeah, uh, there was a dam breach. Uh, around 2,000 people were evacuated um, in some cities. Um, uh, Arnis, where a dike breach uh, appeared, uh, in Podersby and in Marsholm, where there was a strong danger of a dike breach. Um, and in Eckernförde and Schleswig, um, uh, there were some uh, voluntarily uh, evacuations, altogether around 2,000 people. Those are the um, yeah, flood maps um, uh, where the civil protection works with. And um, uh, <coughs> you see this, for example, um, for the Schlei region. And the numbers indicate the uh, number of inhabitants which um, have to be uh, evacuated during a storm surge. These are some pictures of damages at uh, state dikes. Um, uh, this um, location is um, uh, on, on Fehmarn. Got, of course, strong erosion at uh, cliffs, for example, um, Stuhl, which is located uh, close to the Kiel Fjord, or on the right side uh, in, in Schönhagen. Um, <clears throat> so you see the transition zone between uh, a cliff and the revetment. And um, as you can see on the picture, the revetment um, uh, is still there, but the um, <coughs> cliff is eroded for, let's say, yeah, 20 meter uh, of erosion place. Yeah, a lot of um, damage happened to the touristical infrastructure. Um, uh, <coughs> for example, you see it. Um, uh, on the lower part, the sailor, sailing harbor of, of Dam, for example, at the sailing harbor in, in Kiel Schilksee, more than 50 um, boats were sinking during the storm, but um, also at the yeah, touristical infrastructure, for example, in, in Dam or Niendorf, um, yeah, severe damage um, uh, happened. So that's, that's it. Um, yeah, right now there's a yeah, strong political discussion who is uh, responsible for coast protection and a strong discussion has started if the state should uh, take the, um, yeah, the responsibility and the maintenance of some of the regional dikes. Um, uh, this is the discussion which is uh, going on right now. So thank you very much. Thank you as well, Thomas. Very interesting to see uh, how things are organized and how uh, how it affects your region. Um, how did it affect your organization itself? How much? How many people were actually on site and perhaps had some sleepless nights over it? Or during, was it more during, for the municipalities? Um, uh, during the storm surge, uh, a lot of uh, people, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, mapped the uh, the damages. Uh, right now, um, we do a lot of consulting um, to the uh, municipalities and to the um, regional water boards, um, uh, and yeah, try to prepare, prepare what um, yeah 
uh, what be the consequence if the state uh, yeah takes some of the regional dikes uh, uh, yeah in, in maintenance and um, uh, yeah let's say something between yeah 20 30 people are um, yeah in uh, strongly um, uh, and, and, and work with, uh, with this um, topic. But also for you, it's not a common work. It's not an everyday's work, I think. Yes, uh, that's true. We are more focused on the on the North Sea coast, so this is a really a, a new um, experience um, for um, for our state agency. Perhaps something to yeah. We talk later uh, how can we help each other a bit more how can we collaborate or learn together but maybe that's something for discussion at the end of this webinar um so thank you very much thomas um if you have questions please put it in the chat i see that you also have some questions thomas perhaps we can um uh, answer them in the um we move forward to the uk to england um deborah campbell is going to show us about UK point of view. Are you ready? Good morning. Hope so. Sorry. Can you see the front slide? Yes. See the slides, yes. Uh, good morning. I'm Deborah Campbell. I work for the Environment Agency in England, uh, and you'll see on there that I am a coastal flood risk manager uh, in the county of Lincolnshire, but I'm also an area duty manager with the Environment Agency. So uh, during an incident, we, uh, uh, we uh, um, move into incident mode and uh, have incident response roles within the organisation. So um, I uh, will be talking more about fluvial um, flooding. So uh, Storm Babette had a, a much more significant impact from um, rainfall rather than on the coast for us. But I will just run us through the presentation uh, and some of the, the details. So Storm Babette for, uh, for us, um, the, the rain that came uh, came on top of what we'd already had a very wet uh, month of October. Uh, some of the uh, central and eastern parts of, of England and Scotland have been recording more than twice uh, their October whole month average rainfall uh, in the first three weeks of the month. Um, so you see that uh, um, because of that, we um, we were issuing flood warnings and we were expecting uh, expecting the onset of flooding. And we issued flood warnings to, to more than 97,000 properties. Um, the impact of the rain we saw um, in excess of 2,100 properties reported uh, flooding and we had uh, river gauges recording their highest ever levels. We had uh, many records broken for rainfall, significant rainfall amounts uh, and water levels in, in, uh, in many of our rivers. In response to this, uh, we um, you can see in the bottom photograph there, we constructed uh, over a kilometre of demountable barriers uh, and 705 metres, a very precise number of, of, of temporary barriers. So you can see that we um, you know, also on the on the slide on the on the image on the right there as well. We um, show that we have many, many properties were protected by the defences that we have in place and the actions that we took, uh, but the relatively small number of, um, of properties that actually were, were flooded. Looking at the forecast, so uh, overall Storm Babette was a, a well forecast event from, from the Met Office. They were able to provide good information to us. Uh, you can see here on our flood guidance statement uh, on the uh, 18th of October, uh, we were expecting the, the main impacts of Storm Babette to be uh, more in the north and northeast of the, of the country. Um, and we had a, a change actually on the Thursday, the 19th, we saw that the the forecast that forecast changed, and we were looking at the um, more severe impacts in the in the red there, that would be um, um, further down, further south into the into the country, uh, and uh, much more widespread. So it's a real change for for us. On here, we're just showing the the uh, um, sort of the the. Um, success of, of um, the, the defences that we have in place. So on the left there, you can see how widespread the the, um, uh, the impacts of the storm were. 
but these are the uh, these show the larger that the the dots um, the more properties that were actually protected by the defenses that we we have in place um, so you can see concentrations um, certainly over this area here in Lincolnshire, which is my patch, uh, we you know sort of um, we had very significant rainfall, but there were um, you know, sort of thousands of uh, properties um, better protected. So, in all, um, in excess of ninety thousand properties that uh, that benefited from the defences that we actually have in place. Um, against that, other other figures. Um, so these are um, figures we we finding that the figures will continue to change as we go through the coming weeks uh, the number of properties that we've um, had reported as flooding uh, but the flooding came from many different uh, sources as well so um, we've had uh, flooding from um, from fluvial so from out of the rivers out of the drainage systems uh, but also a significant number of surface water flooding so just the sheer volume of of, um, of rain that we saw um, meant that we had a lot of overland flow <clears throat> straight across the uh, the fields and into communities. So we do expect that that, that number of uh, 2,100 will rise, but this is a, um, sort of a figure that is um, sort of perhaps where we've uh, counted more um, flooding of gardens and people's external uh, external to the properties. So in response nationally, um, we are starting our recovery programme now and uh, to, to be able to um, work out uh, what works are required, um, we will be um, undertaking uh, our asset inspection. So we, we need to go out and, and, uh, and look at the damage. Um, so we estimate that uh, there'll be 30,000 asset inspections that we'll, we'll need to uh, undertake. Uh, that's actually in response to Storm Babette and Storm Kieran. We, we saw um, significant impacts from Storm Kieran as well. Out of those 30,000 asset inspections, uh, approximately 14,000 of those inspections have now been completed. Uh, and we continue to, to do those and hopefully by the uh, uh, end of this year or early into next year, we'll have completed the uh, the totality of inspections. And of those that we've undertaken, we've found that 2% of our assets are, are now um, registered as below required condition. So they're, they're not in a, in a state that we, um, we um, need them to be in to perform the, their function. Um, so they will now need to be further assessed for recovery work. So what, what will we need to do? What actions will we need to take? Um, we've done all of this on a risk-based risk -based approach. So we prioritise the asset inspections that we undertake, making sure that where we're aware of damage to to uh, to assets, we're, we're out in those areas first. Um, that enables us to uh, to make um, sort of our mitigation plans now. Uh, if we need to change our, our warning and informing, um, we we can do that. So we've done those those in, uh, asset inspections have been undertaken first, and our recovery works will be prioritised as well, ensuring that. Uh, those areas that present the greatest risk will be the areas that we um, we put at the, the top of that that list for um, undertaking recovery. We've, um, as many have said, we, we've utilised uh, not just the Environment Agency staff to undertake this work. We've used our framework uh, contractors through the supply chain, uh, been in assisting us with uh, the asset inspections, and they'll be uh, key to us as well for, for our recovery works. So we do have um, contracts in place to uh, enable us to uh, to get some of those works done, some of them um, as planned works for recovery and also uh, some of the intermediate works and, and incident response works. So we've had a number of people out on the ground responding to the incident. We've also um, put monitoring in place for some of the um, some of the locations that we've got we'll see one of these actually is in the in Lincolnshire which is in the patch at Fiskerton uh, but we've got many locations where we've got damaged assets around the country and we've got continued monitoring in place so we can check for any further changes um, particularly uh, at the moment we have uh, wet weather still here uh, some of the areas are still underwater that were impacted um, and uh, we continue to, uh, um, uh, to, to monitor uh, certainly on our embankments. So just moving to Lincolnshire, I uh, mentioned this is this is my patch. It it did bring us significant heavy rainfall. We did have that sort of last minute um, change to our forecast. It became uh, we we were expecting more rain as that forecast changed on the, on the Thursday before. Um, 
some of our catchments within Lincolnshire experience more than three times their normal monthly rainfall. Uh, I think it's 365% of the, of the average October rainfall was experienced in uh, in a couple of the uh, in a couple of those catchments, and you can see uh, areas here where we've got up to sort of 80 millimetres of, of rain falling in 24 hours. In some parts of the country, that would be um, could be a manageable amount; it's still significant. But in Lincolnshire, we're one of the driest counties, and uh, uh, a third of Lincolnshire is below sea level, so we have. Um, uh, sort of lowland areas uh, that a lot of the water has to be uh, taken out of the catchments to mechanically pumped out um, and so therefore these were really significant for us uh, and so they're really quite unusual for for uh, Lincolnshire. You can see here that the widespread nature of the flooding, uh, the, each of the blue dots is, uh, is an area where we've had a report of uh, internal flooding um, and in total, um, more than uh, 1,500 reports of, of flood impacts. Um, some of those surface water, some of them um, out of the uh, out of the rivers and, and land drainage. We issued 34 flood warnings um, across the whole of Lincolnshire. Um, so many more flood alerts. So we have different levels of, of uh, flood warnings um, that the Environment Agency issue. Uh, the flood alerts. Um, covered I think almost all of the county and then the flood warnings uh, where we are expecting to see an onset of flooding so we're expecting people issue these warnings are expecting people to take action. Um, we saw approximately 500 square kilometres of agricultural land was inundated across Lincolnshire uh, in response to this some of this was uh, breaches in defences and some of it was overtopping of our defences so the, the, the actual embankments were exceeded. And we did have major incidents declared by the emergency services uh, in two locations. They were more precautionary uh, in place of uh, Wainfleet and Fiskerton. Um, uh, so uh, to, uh, from, this was from, from fluvial, uh, fluvial flooding. Uh, and we have now confirmed that we've got eight breaches in our embankments across the, across the county. So a really significant impact and something a little bit more than we've been uh, anticipating. Um, from that original five day forecast. Thankfully, when the forecast changed and um, the way that the Environment Agency operates, we were able to set, step up um, our incident response model um, and we moved to um, you know, sort of more people in the incident room. The incident room was, was open uh, and we ensured that we'd got more staff and, and resource available to us to, to respond. So uh, in Lincolnshire, just looking at the, um, the, the work that we have under, undertaking or under, going through at the moment, um, we have more than 6,000 assets that need to be inspected. Uh, and uh, this is over a distance of 2,200 kilometres. So, so far we've managed to walk uh, 868 kilometres of those and inspected almost 3,000 uh, of the assets. Uh, and we do expect to, to have all of those done by the end of the year. Um, we've been out doing a, a huge amount of work with uh, with communities and community engagement, uh, making sure that we're uh, we've got um, validating our data, so we know that the areas that uh, have been impacted, uh, we're confirming that with um, uh, with people on the ground. Uh, but we do need to validate the defects that are, are being reported to us. So asset inspections will do that, and further engineering works and assessments to follow. Now, at the moment, we've still got a lot of uh, those areas that were inundated are still underwater. Uh, we can't access some of the uh, some of the locations, so uh, some of our inspections will have to to wait until we can actually get down. We've done drone inspections, but not managed to get uh, people out on the ground yet. Um, and it will be very difficult for us to undertake uh, some of the repair works that are, are required um, because of the, those difficult ground conditions. Other work we're doing is we'll, um, after every incident, we review the flood warnings that have been issued. Um, did they go out? Did they reach the, the right people? Um, did we get the timings right? Were the thresholds correct? So that's something that we do um, on all occasions. So those works are, are ongoing. Um, Think about the, the, the response and, and the impact on, on the Environment Agency. Many of the people that are undertaking this work in response to, to Storm Baba and Storm Kieran um, 
would have been doing uh, other work as part of their day job. Um, so it's a, a real balancing act for us at the moment as to uh, sort of our recovery work and uh, and our ongoing um, the ongoing day job. Um, so just a, a few areas uh, just to, to share with you. So this is the the, the uh, River Witham. So it's uh, a very it's it's a large catchment in in Lincolnshire. Uh, it's a lowland system and it's divided into two uh, two systems. Um, so you can see that you've got all of the the upper Witham, which is sort of upstream of Lincoln here, uh, and then the lower Witham that comes um, sort of downstream of Lincoln and goes out to um, out to the wash, which is uh, out to the sea. Uh, the upper Witham um, has in these blue areas, blue hatched areas that you can see here. These are the flood storage um, areas. So we we have um, a significant number of, of flood storage reservoirs there that um, hold water back from flowing into Lincoln. Uh, so those uh, better protect 7,000 properties in the city of Lincoln. But then as you move uh, downstream of Lincoln, you're into the Fenland system. So low lying um, areas uh, and these photographs on the left here are, um, are the areas that are in the lower with them. And you can see here um, on the bottom right photograph, we've got a breach through um, one of our embankments. Um, this isn't uncommon for us in this part of the, the, the country, uh, the, the catchment. So it is actually around this section here, just uh, east of Lincoln. Um, you can see from the top left photo in 2019, we had um, similar impacts um, in, the, in the same area. The, the water actually to 2023 is slightly wider spread in 2023, um, but it all depends on where we get the breaches in, in the banks. Um, so, uh, you know, a real issue for us and uh, all of the banks in this area are, are now damaged. They've been uh, overtopped uh, and we're looking at um, sort of what, what the response will be and what our recovery in this area will look like, um, mindful of the fact that we, we may find ourselves back here again in um, in another th three or four years. This is a, a similar, um, the, the same area. So actually up here, this is the area that we were just looking at. Uh, and this is the Witham, uh, the river Witham running down. And this water that's on the left here was not actually uh, overtopped out of the bank. It came round through the top of the system and found its way into uh, into the fen, which would have been part of the original floodplain. I mentioned that we'd had two um, communities that had been evacuated, uh, and actually uh, this is um, Fiskerton, village of Fiskerton here, and you can see the water uh, sort of lapping up against the, the village there, and it was actually, uh, that was one of the communities where we um, evacuated 80 homes, uh, and that was done. Um, unfortunately, at midnight. So that was, uh, you know, thinking of the uh, stress and the emotion for uh, the community, uh, a really stressful time for them. Um, and one of the reasons for that is we've got the rising waters, but you can see on these bottom photographs here, um, we've got a, a slip, quite a significant slip in the bank. Um, and we had our, our rather crude monitoring that we had to put in. Uh, at very short notice, so this uh, the um, the poles were set up with uh, CCTV um, and uh, floodlights, and we had a, a, an hourly um, monitoring put in place as we checked for um, uh, checking the, the stability of the bank. As you see, that is quite a, a significant slip in the bank, and we believe that that's actually um, where we've had water on what should not ordinarily be the dry side of the bank. Um, it's uh, it's uh, liquefied um, um, some of the peat and uh, um, uh, sand layers that we have through a lot of these banks uh, and cause that slip on the back side. Here, just a, another example. This is in a similar area, marsh drain area. Uh, you can see that we've um, uh, the, these banks are made from the arisings of um, when the uh, when the channels were cut, and we do know that um, we have sand and peat throughout all of these, and and this is just an, an example of um, one of the uh, one of the locations where we didn't actually get a, a full breach, um, but there is uh, still water seeping through these banks, and and as it stands at the moment. Um, 
it's it's wet and rainy here with a forecast of a wet December and the, the water will continue to flow through uh, these banks as they've been damaged. Another example here, this is um, uh, on the on the River Bain, but still um, sort of in a similar location. This this flows into, into the River Witham. And you can see from the photograph um, on the bottom there that we've actually got uh, a breach in the in the bank uh, at this location. The water flows actually from the bottom to the top of the picture. Um, and this is a, a, a gravel pit, gravel extraction pit that's adjacent to the breach. Uh, this happened on the Saturday, um, uh, so the first uh, second day of the of the incident, and uh, we had to do a very quick evaluation of um, whether or not we expected whether we needed to change our warning and informing. Uh, there are properties um, that are um, sort of just up here at the, at the top of the of the plan here. Um, but we made the evaluation that actually the water would flow and take an old the old watercourse, the old river uh, route, and actually it did pop back into the river um, uh, before it uh, before it impacted on the properties. This area doesn't actually look very different at the moment and, and is likely to stay like this for, for some time. Um, we, ex uh, we anticipate from the initial inspections that this breach uh, would cost likely uh, in excess of two million pounds. It's a very deep and, and large breach in a very difficult location. So one of the things that we're considering with all of our uh, recovery work is, is, is the best way to recover. Is it to fix things back to where they were or are there some more sustainable alternatives that we can consider for the future? Just more examples of, of the, um, the uh, impacts that we've seen. And, and this is a very typical, these are very typical pictures of the um, uh, overtopping of the defences we've seen. Uh, this one's actually north in northern Lincolnshire in the Anco uh, Valley. Uh, and both of these um, have now had some inspection works done, but again, are still uh, primarily underwater in, in many of the locations, uh, but will require significant works to uh, to fix where we've had the damage and scour from the uh, topping. Um, this one I put in just as a reminder, we've we've done an awful lot of work. So a lot of the a third Lincolnshire is below sea level. And I mentioned that we we pump out a lot of the water through land drainage. So not just the Environment Agency, but we have drainage boards in England as well. And a lot of the land drainage pumps have been overwhelmed. So uh, we've got temporary pumps that have been um, brought out to, to Lincolnshire and are assisting in draining down um, in some of those catchments. Uh, these come from a national uh, pool of resource. So we have uh, temporary barriers and pumps um, that are used. And then depending on the, the, the worst hit locations during an incident, we, uh, we can nationally deploy um, these pumps. So they are uh, you know, a very, very useful resource for us. Uh, an interesting one that got thrown in as we were in the midst of, of the incident. Um, so I think we dealt with eight unusual um, sort of uh, planning uh, requests for us to deal with sort of considering exceedance of our washlands, um, uh, water levels higher in adjacent catchments and adjacent areas that might actually um, spill over into our catchments. Um, but this one was a slightly unusual one. This is on the uh, the north of, of uh, Lincolnshire. And you can see on the left hand side here, um, we had uh, one of the boats. It became uh, dislodged from its or, or lost its moorings uh, and got wedged into the sluice gate um, at the Ancombe Valley outlet. So the areas that we were just looking at before with the, with the overtopping. Um, so not only did that block the water from flowing out and, and sort of discharging and keeping the water levels down, um, which was of some concern. The greatest concern for us actually was that these are tidal gates. And although in the height of the incident, we were on neap tides, on low tides, we knew that spring tides were coming towards the end of the week. And our, our concern actually at this location was that we would have uh, high spring tides coming up through the catchments that were already very wet. Uh, and therefore we would see even more flooding um, uh, of those catchments. But we did manage to uh, eventually uh, remove the uh, remove the vessel 
uh, and we uh, on the right hand side there we, we managed to get the crane in to uh, to also lift the tidal gates out and we got them repaired within 12 hours put back in in time for the um, in time for the spring tides um, do you have any slides still to go because uh, we also have uh, Steve waiting to share his uh, lessons learned yeah uh, how many is it? Just finishing up, just finishing up, Petra. This is my last one. Um, so this is um, just the the other um, location that we had was uh, with um, uh, at Wayfleet, which was the other community that was evacuated. Uh, you can see here significant overtopping. In 2019, Wayfleet, we we had a significant breach in the defences. Uh, but at, on this occasion, you can see that we've got. Um, quite long. We had we had kilometre lengths of overtopping of the defences, but what that meant is we didn't it didn't lead to a breach. Um, so on this occasion, the, um, the the levels were able to to go. We've we've still got a lot of water around, um, but that has um, uh, is is starting to subside. So I think this was our, our success story really that we um, managed the water levels across the Wainfleet catchment. And that's me done, Petra. Sorry, <laughs> lots okay, to say. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting, and I also forgot the time because I was listening to you. So it's just because we have so many interesting stories to share in such a short period of time. Um, just one slide, one very small question is um, because you have experienced quite a lot of uh, floodings in, over the years, and we have been learning from you already in pre webinars earlier how to deal with it, how to deal with your team, how to take care of your team uh, during this during the event itself and in recovery time as well. Is there something else, something special that you would like to share from this event, of these two storms? Perhaps it would be a success as well because you have been, you know, uh, experiencing so many um, floodings over the years. I, d I do think that uh, each incident is, is unique um, and um, we prepare and we do an awful lot of work at the Environment Agency in our preparedness for incident response. Um, I think it's the, the, the working with the teams, it's it's around communication and support and planning. And, and planning is key. As I said about the, the change in the forecast, uh, we had to step up our incident response work sort of very rapidly. Um, and it's the planning, making sure that we've got people that are confident and competent in their incident response roles that can step up and um, the mutual aid, we had people come in from up from London to come and assist us. We had people that came to operate pumps from all around the country. So it is, I think it is about planning and, and communication and, and making sure our staff feel supported to, to sort of make uh, make the decisions in the roles that they're in. Thank you very much. I think we can learn a lot from you. Yeah. To be confident in such extreme events um, is not easy to, to build up, I think. So uh, perhaps we should <laughs> learn from you again. Um, I try. I think I will catch up with you later and see if we can uh, learn from you uh, um, from this organisation as well. Yeah. I've done that before, but maybe um, I think we still need to learn a lot from you guys. So thank you very much. Um, qu uh, questions, please, in the chat. And let's go to Steve in Scotland. Are you ready to share your insights? Yes, hello, good morning. Um, I think my, my slide should be loading up now. Yes. Have you got, got it there? Yeah, Excellent. OK, so um, thank you very much uh, for the chance to give you a, a, a chat about um, what happened in Scotland um, during what was, to be honest, a series of storms that swept across us. Um, right from the beginning of October, I, I think we had four named storms and two storms in between. Um, and so to some degree, it's the cumulative effect of those that that uh, really makes the biggest impact. So um, I have a confession to make that during Babette, I was here in Crete <laughs> enjoying 30 degrees, uh, no wind, no rain. Um, but uh, but you, even even though I was there, I, I was looking at the news and, and reading at the, the headlines from BBC and in the run up to Babette, I, it was forecasting for the area I live, I, between 200 and 250 mil of rain 
um, during the course of a couple of days, and I thought it was a misprint because that's just just unheard of on the east coast east coast of Scotland. Um, but sure enough, I, when when I did um, when the storm did did pass, um, that area northeast Scotland did have over two hundred mil of of rain during Babette. But not not only that, um, if the the map on the right there shows the wind speed. So um, again, east coast of Scotland, not far from where I live, um, we were hitting uh, gust speeds of 125 kilometres per hour at the coast, significantly higher up in the mountains. But that's that's pretty severe at at the coast. Uh, so you would expect there to be quite significant impacts um, and probably the biggest headline was in a uh, Brechin again a, a coastal town up in the northeast of Scotland it has a river called the River South Esk which runs past it this is River Street um, in Brechin a uh, flood defence scheme was built there I can't remember exactly when less than 10 years ago the flood scheme was finished um, and the flood scheme uh, was bypassed and, and the town flooded, which was quite, quite bad. I can remember actually sitting in the, in the hotel um, reading the news and um, reading an article where the chief executive of the local authority had been describing what the defences had been designed to and what the river levels were forecast to get to and saying that when they get to that height, we don't know what will happen because we've never experienced anything quite like it. So um, yeah, so there was damage across across uh, that sort of eastern and central Scotland from the rain rather like like Deborah there. Um, but a lot of the news um, reports I saw had pictures of big waves, huge big waves crashing into the, the coastline. Um, but strangely, not much by way of reports of coastal flooding um, during Babette. And when I got back home, I realised that that was actually the case, that we didn't actually suffer a lot of coastal flooding as a result of Babette. It was mainly a, a fluvial event as well. Um, I've got this is an extract from a, a wave boy and tide gauge down in the fourth estuary just by Edinburgh. The first sort of amber box there that you see, that's the wave conditions, wave height during uh, Babette. And what I want you to look at though is the green box further on, which is an event I've shown both in the waves and the tide there later on in the month when when I was back in the in Scotland. And much lower waves there, but much higher tides. As you can see, Babette hit us on neat tides and the peak of the event was as we were heading into the lowest, lowest tides. Um, but this other event that came just over a week later hit us at the height of springs. So looking at the wave boy in the first of fourth, uh, what we find was that Babette was, a, was the biggest on record that we had in over 20 years. Um, and by some margin, now there is a wee bit of checking of data to be done. And um, there was a, a little spike there, but even if you remove that spike, it was the highest event that we've we've had. Uh, that later event didn't really feature in terms of, of, you know, significant wave events. I think it was down around the number 62 in the in the daily um, wave records. So on the face of it, it doesn't look particularly um, exceptional. And it's a similar so story further north, uh, where in this case, that second event was a bit more significant in terms of, of wave heights. Um, in fact, it came in at number 10, uh, whereas Babette was coming in at number four. So why, why am I um, going through this? So, well, as I said, in Babette, we didn't have um, really that many significant impacts, but in this later event, uh, we did. We had uh, quite widespread uh, impacts. So again, not much on the flooding side, 
but in terms of erosion and damage to coastal infrastructure, it was really quite exceptional. Um, so the map on the top right there is a uh, Fife, which is just north of of uh, Edinburgh and that coastline, the, the red dots are all the locations where the local authority had reported incidents and damage at the coast and we're still collecting information right across Scotland. But the event itself was very similar in that all the way from the borders, Scottish borders right up to the north of Scotland, there's patches of damage and impacts on, on harbours and beaches and erosion. The top left photograph is on Montrose, where a significant amount of beach was stripped off dune erosion, I'm particularly concerning that because the dunes protect a, a significant low lying land behind it. The bottom left, Stonehaven, where I live, again, quite a lot of waves came over and brought with it a lot of beach uh, material and bits and pieces of trees and that, that had got washed down in the river in the heavy rains that had preceded the event and I uh, further down the coast in our both the, the main uh, rising uh, sewer main was breached which uh, again necessitated uh, emergency actions so um we're still in the process of collating this information it looks like you know many tens of sites have suffered from suffered damage uh, so it's been an unusual event in that there's been a lot of damage, a lot of erosion, but we didn't suffer significant flooding. Um, so it was interesting to see what uh, the other impacts around the North Sea in particular were and how everyone else fared. And I see some similarities, but also a few contrasts as well, uh, possibly because uh, we were where we had our impact is essentially a, an east, an east facing coastline. So I think that just about covers um, everything I wanted to say. And thanks again for the opportunity to share that with you. And really interesting to hear the rest of your experiences. Thanks. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, there are different um, impacts in Paoli compared to your know, neighbours in the south. Um, just one question. Did, did you already expect it, the erosion that you shared? Were, were these uh, the, the known hotspots, so to, so to say? In some cases, yes. I mean, Montrose, um, a colleague, I think he's on the call, Alistair Rennie, has been working with Angus Council and, and monitoring those dunes for some time now. Um, and I think during Babette, there wasn't, there didn't seem to be, you know, again, really severe erosion there. But at that later event, it was really quite exceptional. Um, the dunes eroded and there was a section of hard defences further to the south in Montrose, which collapsed in a couple of areas. Uh, so whether it was just a combination of the high tides and the waves that, that came with it, not exceptional waves offshore, but they were getting, getting onshore, um, or whether uh, Babette itself had done some uh, pre-work on the coastline and maybe lowering beaches. That was certainly what I thought from the town I live in. I thought the beach had been flattened out rather um, before the second event, event came along. So maybe it, it kind of softened the coast up a little bit, but still some quite, you know, still got some analysis to do on that to, to work out exactly what's happened. Um, and is it a combination of storms? Is it just that, you know, the joint probability of getting uh, waves and high water levels at the same time? Or is there something in there about direction as well? But I think we didn't expect, we wouldn't have forecast to have that amount of damage that we did have. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was more significant than we would have thought based on the forecasts alone. Okay. And so, so in more of the north here, but not really impacted, like Dundee also has a low line stretch, I believe. So that yeah, was... I mean, D Dundee Broad Ferry has relatively new flood defences there, and I, uh, you know, there's certainly been no reports of any significant flooding there. A lot of wave splashing and 
and water um, coming over uh, spray and so on, but not ponding in significant amounts to, to cause a lot of damage, so mainly structural damage and erosion. So thank you so very much. I think we're running out of time. Um, I think we should wrap up. I asked already in this chat if anybody has some suggestions for a follow-up webinar or to dive deeper into some topics, please share that with me. Send it in email or in the chat. And in the meantime, well, we do, I have still have some time. If uh, people want to stay along and discuss a little bit, then be very welcome. But for I will stop recording and we can speak freely and chaotic as you used to be <laughs> to do in creating meetings. Um, so thank you very much for attending this very, very interesting uh, presentations of our colleagues and um, well, stay if you want to discuss a bit further. Thank you all. Well, I hope I did not do something wrong. <laughs> Try again because I hope I did not throw away the recordings now. It seems to still be recording. Sorry, it's still recording. I think so. Okay, that's that's good. Then I stop it now. Working with two devices is always a little bit. No, it stops.